Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. Welcome back, listeners. Thank you so much for joining us again today. I have something extra special for you. With me is Rachel Barr. She is the director and producer of a movie called um, Dancer, Not Dementia, which was released in January on YouTube, which will be linked in the show notes as usual. And uh, I got to see a clip so far and it was beautiful. So thank you for joining me, Rachel. Thanks for having me, Jennifer. You're welcome. So tell us a little bit about you, your background, why you picked this particular topic. Sure. So uh, my background is in dance. I, I, I grew up in dance. I trained uh, professionally at Canada's National Ballet School. I, I danced professionally um, uh, in uh, companies around the world. And uh, when I went back to school, I went to university later in life and I I thought I'd have nothing to do with dance. Um, I wanted to uh, study something new. Um, started down the route of psychology, you know, studying human behavior. And it just one thing led to another. And I started found myself researching dance and um, initially started looking at um, how dance is, is learned um, in the brain. And because as a dancer, knowing that expertise uh, of complex motor sequences actually at some point point feels very habitual. Um, so very curious to how that happened. So that, that was my initial focus was, was really um, looking at dance in the brain. Um, but doing that with uh, professional dancers actually started to um, led me to ask questions around, well, um, how is dance experienced by uh, people um, who, who are experiencing degeneration in the brain. And initially that was with people living with Parkinson's disease. It's a, um, movement disorder. Um, and some of the same areas of the brain were implicated that we were looking at, um, in our expert dancers. Um, and that actually kind of led me to start, uh, learning more about offering, uh, dance opportunities for older adults um, which uh, then led to, um, as well, people living with dementia tend to tend to most often be older people. So uh, that kind of kept going, and, and that actually became a whole research um, uh, area of interest for me, which is uh, dance in, in older adulthood. So you just kept sliding down that path. <laughs> you know, they say you can take the, the dance out of the dance, but you just can't take the dance out of the dancer. So I, I really... Couldn't have imagined that, that you know, I thought I was going to do something new, but I just, um, I've only kind of been, um, I, I would say, fallen in love with my art form again uh, through this this research and, and through this, this route of accessing it and understanding it. Which is fantastic. It's like you're, you're learning all about dance through a whole different modality, which is really cool. So do you have anybody in your family that's got any neurodegenerative diseases? Uh, I do. Um, but, uh, to be fair, it, it, it wasn't what connected me to this, this work. Um, uh, I think it, it actually really was me seeing the potential of dance. I think the potential that dance has always had to really be a really, um, adaptive and important part of, of human culture, um, and really understanding it in, in a new way. And, you know, I, I've been a performer, so it, it had really been really on stage behind that proscenium arch that, that, um, I understood was one way that dance could be experienced. Um, but this, this work really put dance, uh, for me back in the community. And I really love that because I, I, I experienced so much personal benefit and joy from being a dancer that, just the opportunity to share that with, with more people, I think just kind of, like I said, let's sort of relit the passion for me as to why I think probably as a little girl, I, I, I fell in love with this art form. That makes sense. I know that, you know, there's lots of quote unquote advice on how to maintain your cognitive abilities. Basically what you're doing is you're growing more neurons, which is neuroplasticity you know, I never thought I'd learn all this sciencey stuff doing a podcast, but here I am. And one of the recommendations is generally like learn some new dance steps. And so did you find anything 
um, similar in your research that learning dance, maybe as a you know an adult or older adult, actually benefits our cognition? So uh, thanks for the question. My research hasn't been on prevention um, specifically. Uh, when I've worked with uh, people living with uh, Parkinson's disease or dementia, they, they already have the diagnosis, um, and I haven't. So I haven't been looking at at, at that specifically. But um, in theory, and actually, there are some researchers that have published in this. Um, in terms of activity, um, if, if you had to pick one activity to engage in, and you think about dance, it engages the body physically. It engages the body cognitively, right? It's complex motor sequence. It's not just walking on a treadmill. Um, you have to remember patterns. You have to cue it to music. Um, you know, you need to retain that information and build on it. You know, week to week. If you weren't, you know, learning a dance, um, and it it um, engages you emotionally and socially because um, you know music has meaning. Interactions with other people through the eye contact, the, the work you're doing has meaning and also what you're choosing to express has meaning. So if you're going to pick one activity um, and take as many um, boxes off as, as, as you can in terms of what we know about how to um, maximize your potential um, in older adulthood, uh, you're probably going to get the most bang for your buck with, with dance. Um, and I, there, like I said, there has been some research that has compared it to other um, activities, um, in terms of prevention, um, that hasn't been my work specifically, but, uh, you know, it could also be, I, I am a bit biased. I'm very passionate about, about dance, but, uh, certainly if somebody is, is curious, I'd encourage them to, to, uh, to try it, try it out because, um, I have yet to see in our older, um, adult classes, somebody, you know, come, maybe they've never, ever danced before, but, uh, actually really, enjoyed it. it makes I, I can see that. Now you've worked um, with, or you, part of your research was with people with Parkinson's. I have a, a family friend who has Parkinson's. One of the um, activities he did to kind of help maintain his balance and um, kind of stabilize where he was at with the disease was boxing, mm -hmm. which is kind of, I mean, you've got movements and they're not choreographed per se like dance, but I can kind of see a little similarity, but I would think dance would be taking that even a step further, like because you have to you have to use a few more complex tools in your mind, you know, get, like you said, cue it with music, build on it. Um, what what did you discover with people with Parkinson's and how it helped them? So um uh, I'll say that the, the dance for people living with Parkinson's literature is very well established. Um, dozens of papers have been uh, published, including review papers. Um, uh, and um, it, it does, you know, really uh, for that, for, for people living with Parkinson's really strongly suggest that it is um, quite beneficial on, on many levels. And there, there are, I'll say this, any activity that you find accessible and engaging, um, you should be doing, um, especially in, in, in older adulthood. So, you know, if, if it's not dance, then it's not dance. If it's boxing, it, it's, you know, just do it. If, if you want to, you know, tandem um, cycling, if that if that's if that's what you're into, to go for it. Um, but the, the, the support for dance is quite profound in that it's not just the physical benefits, it's not just the emotional benefits, um, not just the social benefits, but it's it's also the very low attrition rates where, you know, you get people starting to dance and they keep coming back, which you can't necessarily say with some of these other um, interventions uh, that are, or like physio, you know, you, you, it's not as inspiring to sustain it. Um, and I think that that's a key factor too. Like we all know we should be exercising, but we don't, um, you know, it's, it's hard to sustain. Um, whereas dance is sort of coming from a different uh, angle and, and certainly our, our approach to it actually as well, in particular um, with, with all of our, our dance um, uh, programming for, for older people is it's actually not that approach of an intervention or we're not trying to make it a therapy. We're actually trying to, um, our programs are meant to make the dance um, experience accessible. 
um, for whatever community we're working with. So if we're working with people um, living with Parkinson's, we'll take certain considerations into account. If we're working with people living with dementia, of course, we'll take those considerations in how we we offer the dance opportunity. But um, we're not we're not talking about the disease in the program addressing the disease specific symptoms. We are uh, creating more accessible opportunities to dance because um, my position certainly is that all humans benefit from dancing. And if, if we can make the experience accessible across the lifespan, then we can benefit from it uh, across the lifespan. I believe that. And dance is a lot more fun than a lot. I would think dance is more fun than boxing. And I've done, <laughs> I've done both. I've done boxing exercise classes and they're okay, but I, I'm, I'm more on the dance side. So how did you go from your university research to the movie? And I'm sure I'm taking like a big leap because I'm assuming that you've also worked with people in the community and that led to the movie, but I'll let you explain that. <laughs> so, um, yeah, you're right. It's, it's not a, nothing's a straight line, but I'll try to, to paint as, as, as direct a line as possible in, in a few minutes. Um, one of the, the research projects that we, we did, and we actually just published a, a book about, it's called Dance, Aging, and Collaborative Arts-Based Research, where we were looking at, it was a qualitative study, not, not quantitative. We were, we were observing, we were talking to people um, to understand how dance supports people living with uh, dementia and their carers. Um, and uh, really two key findings were really captured um, in a lot of different ways qualitatively in this, in this study. Uh, it was a four-year study and we were in non-urban centers offering dance in Ontario, the province uh, that I'm in and our uh, neighboring province, um, Manitoba here in Canada. And the two key findings were that dance uh, supports the social inclusion of people living with dementia and their carers. So opportunities to actually be, be part of a community, have, um, have meaningful engagement with the community. And the other um, key finding, which, you know, wasn't even directly, I would say, um, uh, kind of thought of maybe as we initiated the research project, but that really came out quite profoundly in the work was the way in which dance challenges uh, dementia related stigma. And I'll give you I'll give you some examples of this where we would hear people that we were talking to about the opportunity to dance, you know, um, uh, care, carers, uh, um, formal informal carers of people living with dementia say, oh, I I didn't know he could move like that. I, I didn't know she had that in in him, like with the, that that twinge of, of surprise. Um, right. Because um, what uh, so many of us carry and myself included and, and you know, constantly re relearning this is that just because you have a diagnosis of dementia doesn't mean you don't have the capacity to be creative and, and joyful and and silly and and all sorts of different th things that um, I think is is often overshadowed by we know the challenges we know how difficult it can be for the person living with dementia for the people that that care for them and, and not to minimize that at all um but it just doesn't mean that you don't have a uh, capacity for for all this beauty and and joy and that's something that um a lot of people kind of it, it really came out um in in the work that just that that opportunity to dance um with people living with dementia helped people see them um, I see a side of them that wasn't dementia. And that that's led to um, a grant we received from the Public Health Agency of, of Canada to, to really disseminate this idea. Um, and that dance um, is a great tool to, to challenge uh, dementia-related stigma, which, which led to a, a campaign that we, we launched um, last year, uh, which we intentionally called Dancer Not Dementia. Um, because we wanted to challenge that stigma, and everyone in our dance classes is is referred to um, as a as a dancer, and that's um, our dance classes for people living with dementia, but also here at Canada's National Ballet School, also our, our professional ballet students. We call them dancers too. So, um, you know, acknowledging that they're people and not their disease. So we sort of um, you know focused on our area and really just wanted to say you know, dancer, you're a dancer here, you're, you're not your disease, you're not, not dementia. And that all led to this, this film, um, 
that we we created to to further disseminate the, these ideas um, that uh, you know we we've we've been very fortunate to put together. Um, uh, it was a bit challenging, obviously, with the with uh, some of the the uh, COVID restrictions, um, especially in long term care, where we wanted to film it, but uh, we managed to get it done. Um, and uh, it's just been uh, great and, and so far really, really well received. So did you start taking dance programs to long-term care communities and then you start on the film, I'm assuming? So um, in, in Canada, we, we developed a program, um, the program that was researched um, uh, called Sharing Dance Older Adults. Um, and uh, this idea of obviously sharing dance, we, we partnered with... Um, Baycrest Health Sciences, their uh, Toronto-based um, geriatric uh, uh, research institute, hospital, and long-term care facility, and we we, we co-developed a, a program um, for older people with uh, different physical and cognitive abilities. So not not diagnosis specific, but really just um, reaching older people um, uh, with different that might need different needs than a than a traditional dance class. And so we we that started you know as far back as like 2013 we started um, offering uh, developing that that program and then you know uh, Canada's big and we we wanted to reach more people so in 2016 so the, the the research study I just talked about it was actually the remote delivery so the virtual delivery of this program um, in non urban communities and this was you know predates COVID and Zoom and and all of the, all of that uh, where we recognized. Um, the, who are the, you know, communities that have the least access to dance. And so that, that's why we wanted to, to offer this, uh, virtual version where, um, uh, groups still, still came together to dance. So there's still that social interaction, but we were streamed, um, we had stream classes, um, that we, we were on the screen. Um, and so, uh, that, that, that's now available in, in Canada, uh, across the country. We have a, an app. Um, sharing dance older adults or and you can access it online too. either we have an at-home version but also uh, the, the group version now is, is is sort of picking up again um, now that uh, uh, people are feeling more comfortable coming together and so what kind of I'm sure you have lots of really interesting stories about working with um, residents in the long-term care community do you have any that kind of pop in your head when I bring it up well, um, actually, we were just last week um, doing a, one of our training sessions for for dance teachers um, uh, learning to teach dance uh, to to older people living with dementia. And um, I was uh, offering a dance to the group. Um, we, we were going to go to a C. It didn't matter which C, you know, whatever, you know, it could have been the the Caribbean, it could have been the Mediterranean, wherever people wanted to go. And and um, we had our, our wonderful musician with us on the piano. We started swimming. And, um, you know, then I, I said to the, the group, you might want, maybe we want to just float on our backs. And I said, let's float on our backs. And I said, feel the sun, feel the sun as it's warming your body and the, the brightness. And and one of the dancers in the class, you know, her eyes were closed and she just said, oh, that feels good. Um, right. And, and I, I wanted to give this example, like it, it, of course, made me smile in the moment. But I think if people are trying to understand dance, right, there's lots of ways to understand it. Um, you know, my background is in classical ballet and, and in classical ballet, a lot of it is storytelling. Um, and so we um, infuse a lot of that into, into our work because, um, uh, it, it really kind of opens people up to being creative and it helps people, um, uh, be present in, in an experience, you know, whether it's real or not, but that they, they, they go with you. And, and I think that imagination and playfulness that we, you know, we, we, we typically, you know, kind of, um, uh, only like, allow like young children to, to kind of access or, or play with. I think that opportunity at all stages of life, um, it can, it can be really, um, uh, joyful and fun. And so it was just, it was really a nice experience to kind of feel that, you know, 
she was with me, you know, whatever you see, you know, feeling the warm sun. I felt it too. It, it did feel good. And I, I think um, that's just sort of, sort of an example of, of things that you, you know, you might not be sure somebody is, is with you in the dance classes. You know, when we go into long-term care, it looks different. You're not going to, not everybody's going to move, you know, full out with feeling. Um, they might just be tapping their foot. They might just be clapping their hands or even nodding their head. Or sometimes, you know, you invite them in to dance and say, no, I'm just going to watch you. Um, but all of that is, is engagement. Um, there, there's no, there's no right or wrong. And, and what is profound is, is the way that that is able to help, um, help people uh, feel good and experience, you know, um, joy and, and other, other positive experiences like feeling the warm sun. That's really cool. And I could feel the warm sun, although it might be the heater that's underneath the desk. <laughs> well, for, for me in Canada, it was, it, I was really trying to picture someplace warm, warm and hot. It was a pretty, pretty cold. <laughs> yes. I live across the street from a lake and I like paddle boarding and that's, that's where my brain went. I, you know, the Pacific Ocean is cold compared to the Atlantic Ocean, which is weird um, unless you get to Hawaii. But on our coast, it's cold, cold. So I like the lake and it's a man-made lake, so it's not very deep. So it's not cold. It's lovely. It's perfect. It's a perfect lake almost. <laughs> but you were, talk you were talking about people that don't necessarily participate beyond maybe toe tapping or clapping um, this is a rev revelation nobody has heard in almost 300 episodes. So way back in the late eighties and nineties, my husband and I DJed weddings and there was times when some of the crowds were tough, man. They're, we referred to them as the toe tappers, the people you, you know, you could tell they were enjoying the music, but you just couldn't get them out of the chairs. <laughs> so it, that made me smile when you said that, you know, that's still engagement. It just brought that memory back, back to my mind, but go ahead. You were going to. Did you have another oh, story? No, that, that, I mean, that's great. And I think, um, you know, it, it, it's interesting because we, we are, I think we, we, we always, what, what's, we respond to what's big and what's, what, what we can see with our eyes, I think, um, understandably. And uh, just uh, working with, with people living with dementia and it, it has helped me appreciate, you know, there, there's, there's so much more to the subtlety um, in, in all, in all movement, um, you know, that we, we, we tend not to see or, or notice, but uh, uh, I think probably, you know, often toe tappers are having a, having a great time and they'll, and they'll tell you as they're leaving the class, like, oh, that was great. Um, so that's, that's uh, yeah, I could see how you would feel it, feel that way um, at a, at, at a wedding, but um you know, but maybe they were the toe tappers at the, at the wedding too. So, so this is, this is as engaged as they get. As long as they were enjoying the music, we were fine, but it was, you know, that's the job is to get people up and dancing and participating. And, you know, sometimes you'd have groups that were just, you know, they were just more reserved people and, you know, you'd get the bride and groom, maybe some of the bridal party, a bunch of kids. And they'd be like, Oh yeah, yeah. This group is tough, man. Just a bunch of toe tappers. <laughs> Oh my gosh, that is such a flashback because I think my husband stopped DJing in 20, let's see, from 1988 to like 2002, I think. Two, yeah, I think it was 2002. So that was, you know, 21 years ago. <laughs> oh my goodness. So what the clip that I saw to promote the movie, there was a lot of, the, a lot of people participating, they were seated. But what I found very interesting was um, there was a lot of men. And in one brief part of the clip, um, these two men kind of clasp hands. And, you know, they're, you can tell they're connected to each other and they're enjoying themselves. And it was just, it was not something you expect to see two men, you know, participating in dance kind of together. It was, it was, it was interesting. So... Explain how you do some of these programs with the, the residents of the long-term care community. Because it's sure. a little different than maybe with a bunch of six-year-olds or something. Now we're going to take a quick break for an ad. These ads help me continue to bring the show to you for free. When I learned that despite eating as healthy as possible, 
we can still have undernourished brains. I was frustrated. I also live in a farming community, so I'm aware that our food isn't grown as well as we need. Learning about neuro reserves, Relevate, and how it's formulated to fix this problem convinced me to give them a try. Now I know many of you are skeptical, as was I. However, I know it's working because of one simple change. My sweet tooth is gone. I didn't expect that, and it's not something other users have commented on, but here's some truth. My brain always wanted something sweet. Now fruit usually did the trick, but not always. One bad night's sleep would fire up my sugar cravings so much they were almost impossible to ignore. You ever have your brain screaming for a donut? Well, for me, those days are gone. It's been about six months since I started taking the supplement and I have no regrets. I believe in my results so much that I'm passing on my 15% discount to you. Try it for two or three months and see if you have a miraculous sweet tooth cure or maybe just better focus and clarity. It's definitely worth a try. Now back to our conversation. Sure. Yeah. I mean, in, in long-term care, uh, you know, often they are, they, they are regimented with programming. Um, so, you know, there's like traditional program, like you might see like bingo um, or uh, other types of, of group uh, programming, but um the dance, the dance classes, we, we have experienced that, you know, talking about uh, people who maybe don't identify with dance or, you know, often men who will say, oh, I don't dance or I can't dance. Um, but as soon as you get the music going and it's it's music and, and we're very intentional about the music, music means so much to all of us. If it's songs that, you know, um, are nostalgic or songs that that kind of just make you feel good because they have a great, a great beat and are uplifting. It, it's hard. It's hard to not participate. So we, we have um, maybe when asked about it, we've sort of faced a little bit of that. Like, oh, I'm not a dancer. I got two left feet or I don't <laughs> dance, but uh, if they're in the space and then they, they can hear the music, it's never really been actually the, the, um, the barrier that, that, that you would, um, expect it might be, um, because it feels good. And it's, it's, um, you know, obviously very intentional not to make it, um, a gendered experience. Um, you know, some people think of us, you know, we're, we're ballet school. So like, what is this going to be? How is my, you know, 92 year old mother going to, you know, put on point shoes and we're, we're just like, we're, we're not doing that. Right. We're, we're, um, taking, you know, I think some of the great um, components of of good dance pedagogy and ad adapting it for this community. So, you, you know, you talk about the connection between people. When I'm teaching a ballet class to young dancers, I'm talking about eye line. I'm, you know, where are you looking? What are you looking at? Like, that's what you need so that the audience can can follow um, whatever you're, the story you're telling on the stage. So using that in our dance, prompting the dancers to find somebody in the room to to greet with that movement um, or to, to, you know, to offer this this movement to. And that those are the moments that it really you see people connecting. Um, and um, it, it, it's it's quite um, profound because they, they may not always, especially in long term care, be getting that much eye contact. Support is often provided. You'll see people providing care from behind, right? Is it they're wheeling them in or helping them, you know, get moved to and fro or standing, right? Talking to you, I'm standing, you're sitting in a wheelchair and I'm talking to you again, I'm not making eye contact with you. So, you know, intentionally taking, pulling from what we know about teaching dance, but then kind of putting it within this context and realizing actually, you know, we have something to offer. And generally, when you're in the long-term care community, are you leading the class with most of the participants seated? Because I didn't see anybody standing in the clip. So, so sharing dance older adults. Um, uh, the the version of the program that we all, we have two versions of the program in your seat and on your feet. Um, both have a, a both have a seated option. Um, um, even in the on your feet. But when we're working with people uh, with cognitive challenges, we do the in your seat program, not because people living with dementia can't walk. Obviously, lots of them can, but 
um, they may not be able to make safe decisions because um, they may not be know if they can walk um, or stand up safely. So because the focus of the program is actually on being creative, inspiring movement, um, it's it's just it's safer, but also um, really actually in some ways creates opportunity for more possibility of movement, right? Because then they don't have to be navigating balance. Um, so that's that's the focus. We do often get impromptu stand up. Um, and that's why it's important to have, you know, staff uh, support in the room. Somebody will want to dance, stand up and dance because um, that that's what they know. Right. And they get they get excited. Um, so that it, it does happen sort of like uh, uh, impromptu. But um, the, the program is offered from a seated um, position. We encourage the dancers um, often to to stay seated because we we, we want to be able um, for everyone to to participate safely. You don't want people getting so excited they topple over, which would be most unfortunate. <laughs> you know, if, if we had the, you know, if we ran the program with with enough support that those who wanted to stand, you know, could could all have somebody supporting them, I could see, you know, in that way it it working sometimes. But um, again, it's not really the the focus of of our approach isn't really on getting them standing; it's on getting them engaged with dance. Which just makes sense. Um, do you generally, so the um, older adult dance program, I know I just butchered how you normally refer to it. Is it classical music or do you use different genres of music to aid the, in, the engagement? All types of music. Um, what we, when we get to teach in person, um, we get to we try to get to know the community. What kind of music do they like? What is meaningful to to, to them? Um, uh, you know, and, uh, when we're teaching in Toronto, it's it's a it's a very uh, you know diverse city, so it's really relevant to know you know who who is this community and um, is there meaningful music uh, for them? So it it's not um, it's not classical. We, yeah, we throw in some classical and sometimes our dancers really love the classical ballet references, right? Um, depending on getting to know the group, they, they, they want to, they want to hear some Swan Lake and move like a swan. Um, but others not, and we wouldn't, we wouldn't play that. So that's, uh, it's really, um, about as much as we can, you know, sort of meeting that community where they're at, getting to know them and then kind of supporting dance opportunities that would be meaningful to them. Can you visualize like 20 years from now, like the kind of music that'll connect with older adults? Oh, Lord. So I'm 56. So like I'll be almost 80 in 20 years <laughs> and it'll be a whole different type of music than you're probably using now, which sometimes is kind of like an inner, you know, social media kind of conversation about, you know, when I, because of our DJing days, <laughs> it was a long time. I used to think of people that hit their 50th wedding anniversary as um, being married just after World War II. And um, let's see, 50 years from that from now was like 1973. So <laughs> it's a definite different era of music. And I had, you know, it took me a while to to make that shift. Like, you know, time is moving on. Not everybody that celebrated a 50th anniversary got married, you know, post World War II, early 50s was kind of crazy, but you know, we're going to have, you're going to have like dance, older adult disco versions. Soon. Uh, we, we already have that. I would say yeah. in the time that I've been doing this work, like the, in the last decade, um, you know, we may have started more with, you know, Frank Sinatra, but we are definitely getting requests for like Beatles music. Um, so yeah, you definitely see and, and, and ABBA and, uh, you know, that, yeah, it, it's, it's, uh, I, and I've had the thought of, you know, what music am I going to want to be dancing to, um, uh, when I, when I'm hopefully dancing at that age. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's part of it. I think it's, it's something that, that makes it fun is, you know, kind of what's meaningful to, to this group and, and, you know, feeling different music and, and how, how it inspires you to move. Hopefully you won't get a group of people like me is I like all kinds of music and it just depends on my mood. So you'd, you would have to figure out what mood I'm in and then what music fits that mood <laughs> or what music I need to maybe alter a mood. It was one day I was just like, oh, it was during the pandemic and 
I was sick of being at home and, you know, kind of feeling down and negative and like the big black cloud was hanging over my head. And I thought, okay, well, I only really know one way to change this. I'd tried a couple other things, done a workout, et cetera. So I put on some um, Huey Lewis in the news. There's an Apple, um, curated Apple program, music program, where Huey Lewis actually talks about the, um, like the background of what was going on when they recorded this song or what, you know, inspired the song. And it, so it's like him being a radio DJ, which, you know, speaks to my 80s roots and the 80s music. So it was really cool. And man, it did. It only took like one song and poof, the black cloud went away. But there's other days I like, you know, rock or um, alternative or pop. It just depends on my mood. <laughs> I don't think you're alone. I think I'm like that too. And and I think that's a little bit of the fun of creating these dance classes, right? Is when we, we, we don't have to stick to one style the whole class either. So um, we're always mixing it around and we, we might have something really high energy and then we might take it down. Um, you know, to help everybody catch their breath and, and, and calm. And, and, you know, some people will enjoy some more, more than others. So, um, uh, yeah, I think that's part of the fun of, of creating this, this type of work. So how did you go from all this research to creating a whole movie? Cause that's, that's kind of a big leap and a huge undertaking that you must've started before or during the pandemic. <laughs> so we, um, we did, we, we knew, and there, there has been, you know, some research too ab about uh, how film can be a really effective way to, to share messaging about uh, people living with dementia. And um, I think because we really wanted the, the film to challenge uh, dementia related stigma, you know, we, we knew we wanted to have people living with dementia have their, an opportunity to speak um, and to show themselves, uh, dancing. Um, so that really kind of, I think drove the, the film. We worked with an incredible, um, filmmaker, Anthony Granny. Um, so he, he's the one that, that, that made the film and, and our producers, um, here at, at, uh, the ballet school, Sapna Goyle and, um, Dr. Pia Contos, who's a, um, really a, a leading researcher in aging and dementia. So, we had a great team to kind of, you know, ask questions, infuse ideas and, um, but, but really kind of, you know, it, it's not like we had to really kind of stage or dig. This is the stuff that, that happened. Right. And, and you'll see in the film, like we, we went to the long-term care facilities where they lived and spoke to them about dance, danced with them, um, you know, talked about it and, and, um, really it's, it's, I hope they feel also it's it's their story that they got they get to tell you know that they get to show you know what what uh what dance means means for them and that that sort of speaks for itself with with the message we wanted to send yeah there's a message going on social media right now a doctor referred to people living with some sort of cognitive disability as a generation of zombies which who has gotten a lot of a lot of clap back on in, on the internet. And so it's important to show their abilities and what's inside. Um, I have a, a, a past guest. I think she's been on the show three times. The last time um, was with her husband who was diagnosed mild cognitive impairment at 55. And he's always been an engineer, but he worked for Disney. So he was an, an Imagineer. And he was responsible for maintaining the rides at Disneyland. So he wasn't creative like we're talking about with dance or art. And since having to retire from that job, he has gotten into woodworking and painting. And he basically said that he's um, like this part, this side of my brain, like the engineer side of my brain doesn't really work so well anymore. So he's developing the the creative artistic side, which is, you know, a little, a little basic on, you know, brain hemispheres, but you know, it does resonate to what, what kind of what we're talking about. And I find it fascinating that I've talked to people whose loved ones have like, they've gone from stuffy engineer accounting, you know, inside the box kind of person to being somebody that's really creative. And, um, it's just really fascinating. I find the brain absolutely fascinating. If I had 
was half my age and had twice the science ability, I would go into brain research because it's just absolutely fascinating, you know, and we need more of it, obviously. I have, I'm not familiar with any, um, dance and dementia related studies other than what we're talking about today. Are there others out there similar to what you're doing? I'm assuming so. So there, there is a, a, a small, but, um, um, available, uh, you know, academic literature on dance and dementia. Um, one, one challenge that I have with, with a lot of it is the focus on, um, the therapeutic elements of, of dance. So, you know, it's a focus on how, you know, dance can, you know, minimize, like help to address, you know, behavioral outbursts or, um, mood and, and, and not to, not to minimize that. That's great. And, you know, also not to minimize the enormous physical benefits, um, that we all feel when we, when we dance. I think though, that it's a, it's a model of how we see dance and quite frankly, how we see the arts that is, is, is quite narrow. And I think it, it's a bit deceptive because, you know, that then we go, Oh, well, we, we need the arts. Or we need dance because it's, it's good for your health. And it, it's actually the, the reverse, you know, dance is so adaptive. You know, humans have been dancing for the last 40,000 years. Um, we need to keep dancing. You know, we, we, we know, we, we know that all in, intuitively. So, you know, for the research to catch up and explain why and how it is, it's great. And it's, it's kind of a lifelong passion of mine, but it's not because we, we, we don't know, we, we, we can see clearly, um, it is a, a significant contribution to the human experience. So I, I get a little bit, I, I think it's a little bit challenging, um, the, the literature that does exist, but it, it, it does. Um, and I think, uh, I think on one level, more research is very helpful because it does help the health, the health sector to, to come on board and, and slowly make it, um, a priority in understanding that this is, that this supports good, good health. Um, but like I said, it, it limits it in a way. And so, um, one of the, the arguments that, uh, myself and my colleagues make in our, in our book is, um, when, when we, there's been researchers for ch children with, with significant and, and serious disability, um, say, you know, just because they have a disability doesn't mean that they can't flourish, right? You don't have to be healthy to flourish. If you, you know, flourish meant this idea, you know, as from the time of Aristotle that, you know, people have meaning in their life, sense of accomplishment, meaningful relationships, positive emotions. You, you don't need to be healthy to, to still be able to flourish. And so, you know, rather than looking at dance as just a, a health intervention for people living with dementia, we see it as, a, as an aid in supporting human flourishment, um, because it does support, um, meaning it does support positive relationships, positive emotions. And, um, you know, that, that, that's, um, as much a goal in, in, I think any, anyone's life as it is just to stay healthy, um, because, you know, eventually we, you know, our bodies will all <laughs> decline, um, that, that it, it, it is, it is inevitable. And, uh, you know, we can control little bits of this and that, um, that we understand, but, um, supporting flourishment, you know, a lifelong flourishment, I think is something else that we can, should be bringing our, our attention to for, for meaningful life. I fully agree. So what you're saying basically in a nutshell is the people that have been researching dance as it's a therapy for people living with dementia and your, your angle is more how they can flourish, which I absolutely love because my mom was in memory care and she had friends, which she would not have had if she had lived with me. And I just, I still laugh to this day because my mom's name was Diane and she befriended other Diane and they befriended other, other Diane, which was really confusing for those of us who didn't have a cognitive problem. <laughs> and you couldn't ask my mom, where's Diane? Because that confused her. It was just crazy. But those ladies got into mischief. Not anything serious or harmful. Just I walked in mom's room one day and, and her area rug was gone. I was like, what in the living? <laughs> you know, it was like, it was a five by seven foot rug or four by six foot rug. Just, they just, the two of them rolled it up and hid it in the other gal's room. It's just like, why? But it, you know, it, I don't need to know why to just know that the two of them 
I can just picture the two of them doing that and flourishing. I mean, my mom always tried to help the other residents because she had early onset Alzheimer's. Most of the residents were much older than her. And most of them either had walkers or wheelchairs. And she, she would always like lean out her, her door to her room and go, well, just let me know if there's anything I can help you with. Which oh. always cracked me up. Cause I was like, Oh my God, you can barely help yourself. <laughs> but that just gave her meaning and, you yeah. know, made her like feel like she was contributing or at least attempting to contribute. And, you know, and then there was the mischief. So that's an important aspect of all of our lives. And I think it's, you know, it's important that, excuse me, we keep researching that for people who are basically different, you know, mentally than we are, you know, with Alzheimer's or autism or, you know, whatever, you know, we all, we all aren't the same and we just need to figure out how to connect um, different levels so we can all flourish well. Absolutely. So what's next on the agenda for you? It sounds like you've done a lot. Are you taking a break? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, uh, we're still, we're still trying to get this, uh, this film seen by as many people as, as possible and, and foster conversations um, around this. Lots of people that I talked to about it had never thought about it this way. Um, and even, you know, my own generation, you know, talking to friends, um, working in different sectors in, in, in healthcare or, or business, or it just ha hadn't really stopped to, to think about it. Um, so I think really uh, a focus now that, now that we have the film, it's a, it's a great tool to share our message. So really trying to get it um, seen and, and talked about, and then, I think, uh, you know, lifelong goal is to, to keep, uh, uh, finding ways, um, to help people access dance experience dance, because, um, uh, you know, as I, I referenced before, I, I, I know it's, it's, a, it's a really adaptive human experience and, um, in, in a lot of our, um, society and, and, and culture, it's kind of saved for, you know, the, 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 you know, elite, you know, performer or, um, you know, you, oh, I'm not a good dancer, therefore I, I can't do it. But this is something that, you know, we all, we all benefit from. Nobody owns it. It doesn't belong to anyone. It, it's, it's, it's a very human experience. Um, so just trying to find ways to, to support that in, in all the communities that I'm able to connect with. That's, that's a very wonderful life goal. <clears throat> and I think my community has salsa dancing classes. You've inspired me to go check. They have line dancing, but that is not my thing. I'm not into country music. There's <laughs> only a little bit of music I don't like. Um, that's it's all about the music. All about the yeah. music. <laughs> and I don't know. I just, I, I resonate more with salsa dancing. So hopefully I can go find out that they're still doing it. This community has lots of groups and organizations that do different things but of course covid screwed a lot of that up so it's still kind of coming back to life slowly and surely so i'm gonna go check that out because i've thought about doing dance classes for probably a decade and so now <laughs> now you've inspired me to just stop thinking about it maybe maybe take the next step that's great that's wonderful to hear <laughs> you've made, made my day with that <laughs> oh good so <laughs> the the movie is viewable on youtube correct Yep. Uh, okay. Dancer, not dementia. Um, and, uh, please do, uh, if you, any, anybody listening wants to share their, their feedback, you can, you can put it in the, in post it in the comments or, or send it to us directly. Love, love to hear and, and connect with people that have, have seen the film. Well, as always, I will make sure that that is linked in the show notes so you can just click on it. Not that you can't remember that title easily, but I'll just make it really easy for people to get to. I very much appreciate what you're doing and I appreciate that you reached out and wanted to tell me all about it. I'm always amazed. It, I've been doing this podcast for five years. My mom had Alzheimer's for 20. Mom's been gone for three. So I'm a little surprised that I'm still learning things, which is good for my brain. But I always, I'm always excited to learn something new and different in this, this journey of, of helping people, family caregivers like myself. So I appreciate the research and Hopefully, hopefully you will help people understand that flourishing is a goal we should always strive for. Thank you so much for having me, Jennifer. You're welcome. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your podcasts.